Hey everyone, <clears throat> this is a piece from the edited, the volume edited by Phil Slater titled Outlines of a Critique of Technology. I'm going to read the preface to this book, but then I'm going to read the introductory introduction, but it, which is by a person named uh, Monika Reinfelder. Um, so yeah. This book aims to outline the task of a critique of technology. It consists of a relatively small number of articles which, far from exhausting the subject, simply attempt to outline what is at stake. The articles were originally published in either Italian, Pansieri, or German, Kapferer and Bar, and have been specially translated for the present volume. The articles are written from different perspectives and with different emphasis. No attempt has been made to edit out repetitions or divergences, although each article has been provided with a brief introduction by way of contextualization. An overall introduction reconstructs the orthodox tradition with which the critique of technology must first break, as well as drawing together the positive achievements to be consolidated. This seems seemed preferable to reprinting material that has been readily accessible for some time now. The present volume consists, therefore, to, of material previously unavailable in English. Phil Slater. Introduction, Breaking the Spell of Technicism by Monika Reinfelder. Quote, Nothing so corrupted the German labor movement as the belief that it was swimming with the current, a current it located in the dynamic of technological development, end quote. Who's that? Walter Benjamin. Since his death in 1883, arguments over Marx's, quote, message have been characterized by fundamental splits rather than consensus. This makes all the more impressive the fact that on the question of technology, consensus has reigned for close to a century, if not by default. Not that the word, quote, technology is absent from Marxist arguments. On the contrary, the word technology features heavily wherever it is a question of stating, quote, basic principles, and is always in the forefront of debates on the transition to socialism. However, technology itself is rarely considered to pose a problem for Marxist theory. Rather, technology is technology, and that is that, exclamation point. In such fields as politics, economics, and law, such a perspective would be regarded as heresy. Here, as almost all currents of Marxism would concede, what is called for is a critique, but the idea of subjecting technology to the same treatment appears so ludicrous that it need only be mentioned at all in the form of a violent repudiation of those who dare to take the idea seriously to begin with. In an attempt to open up the prospect of a critique of technology, it is useful to recall what Marx meant by a critique of political economy, the indicative subtitle of capital namely to lay bare the categorical framework of political economy, value, equality, free exchange, revenues, etc., as a bourgeois ideology, whereas political economy explained capitalist society in terms of categories that supposedly express transhistorical, quote, natural laws. Marx's critique identifies those categories starting with, quote, value as the mystified expression of a specific, namely capitalist mode of production. Quote, the value form of the product of labor is the most abstract, but also the most universal form of the bourgeois mode of production. By the fact that the value form stamps the bourgeois mode of production as a particular kind of social production of a historical and transitory character. If then we make the mistake of treating the value form as the eternal form of social production, we need necessarily we necessarily overlook the specificity of the value form and consequently of the commodity form together with the commodity forms further developments the money form the capital form etc quote end quote marx this quote mistake is not simply rooted in some, quote, conspiracy to perpetuate bourgeois ideology, but is systematically reproduced in the objective appearance of capitalist production in as far as capitalist production is not subjected to a systematic critique. Marx's capital is therefore not merely a repudiation of the bourgeoisie's overt spokesman, but also and primarily an ideological struggle for the consciousness of the proletariat. Quote, 
Insofar as such a critique represents a class, it can only represent the class whose historical task is the overthrow of the capitalist mode of production, end quote. Marx. None of this is particularly new, of course. Indeed, the historical materialist nature of the critique of political economy is emphasized even by those Marxists whose subsequent theory and practice reveal a total oblivion to its fundamental significance. But when it comes to the question of technology, even, quote, basic principles usually have repressed, regressed to a pre-critical level, just as political economy exhausted itself with the insight that the content of the value form is labor. So Marx exhausted itself with the view that the content of technology is, quote, scientific rationality. Thus, one can say of Marxism's perspective on technology that Marx said of political economies, what Marx said of political economies' perspective on value, namely that, quote, it has never once asked the question why this content has assumed that particular form, end quote. Thereby, the dominant Marxist understanding of technology remains at the level of immediate appearances, and the prospect of a critique is foreclosed. In the absence of a critique, Marxism produces its own brand of bourgeois ideology under the grand title of the, quote, dialectic of history, end quote. According to this evolutionist scheme, class societies, quote, develop the means of production in the narrow interest of extracting maximum surplus labor from the immediate producers, but, so the account continues, this interest, far from determining the means of production, is, in a manner reminiscent of Hegel's, quote, cunning of reason, end quote, actually the unwitting carrier of the means of production, means of production's transcendent goal which is the perfection of man's technical mastery over nature. This obviously involves social relations of production, but these are by way of, quote, attendant circumstances, end quote, mapped onto the autonomous technical processes that constitute the, quote, inner essence of actual historical development. As a result, Marxist, quote, theorization of the objective body of the immediate process of capitalist production is usually and quite logically restricted to a faith that the body in question already constitutes the potential base of socialism. In this way, a historical materialist critical perspective takes second place to the overriding teleology of, quote, technique, and it is for this reason that the critique of technology presupposes breaking the spell of an ideology that can justifiably be labeled technicism. Um, you know, the, this is just a side note, but if you, uh, so there's some critiques of, uh, it's not quite the same thing as technicism. Um, I'm trying to use neutrality as a neutral. Um, but if you are interested in a critique of technological determinism in the sense that the material, uh, physical substratum is the determining factor of social relations for a critique of that notion, um, uh, that kind of like reductive uh, so-called materialist conception of society, which is really a, uh, doesn't really uh, account for, doesn't view materialism in the sense of uh, social relations in production, but in the sense of like the material substratum, uh, technological uh, means of production for a critique of that conception of historical materialism. I recommend uh, listening to the audiobook that I put up by um, Derek Sayer titled uh, The Violence of Abstraction. And uh, that critique is also present in um, other things that I've put up from, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, obviously the critique of technology is becoming way more of a fundamental aspect, just everyday left wing discourse. Uh, because of the uh, climate catastrophe. But there's also moments of critiques of the productivism in the works of Cornelius Castoriadis, obviously, that I have up on the channel, as well as uh, it's even in um, the critique of technological determinism as the framework for historical materialism is also pretty prevalent in the political Marxist, so uh, The Origins of Capitalism by Ellen uh, Mason's Wood, or Mason Wood? I can't remember if it's Mason's or Mason. Anyway, uh, her book, uh, I was checking out, and um, yeah, um, back to the text. Foundations of Technicism, Engels and Kautsky. Always comes back to Engels and Kautsky.
Despite his many positive contributions to Marxism and to Marx's own work, it was Engels, who lived from 1820 to 1895, who first formulated the technicist version of the Marxian legacy. Paradoxically, it was the well-intentioned concern to argue that Marxist thought was not just, quote, economic, which led Engels astray, rather than arguing in the admittedly daunting direction of the natural science, that the natural sciences should, via a critique of their theoretical status, be incorporated into historical materialism. Engels took the opposite direction and reduced historical materialism to the status of an, quote, application of a broader metaphysical system, which not unreasonably has become known as, quote, dialectical materialism. Um, there's a footnote here. It says, in fact, it was Engels who first conceived of the revolutionary analysis of capitalism as a critique of political economy. Um, yeah, I believe... I was going to say, I think the critique of I think I, I think the critique of political economy, uh, by Engels from like eighteen forty three or forty four, uh, he's in one of the collections that I have. It's uh, of the economic and philosophic manuscripts of eighteen forty four. So, um, it might be already in a book that you have sitting on your bookshelf. Anyway, quote dialectical materialism begins analogous to the Leviathan of Thomas Hobbes who lived from 1588 to 1679, not with specific societies, nor with society in general, nor even with man in general, but with the, quote, most general laws, and quote, of all motion, laws which must be, quote, valid just as much for motion in nature and human history as for the motion of thought, end quote. According to this theory, matter, which is primary, moves by contradictions, and this movement is, quote, reflected in the movement of mind, which is secondary. Within this metaphysical system, the technological ensemble appears in the indeterminate form of an objective application of man's, quote, rapidly growing knowledge of the laws of nature, end quote. Thus, quote, in the most advanced industrial countries, we have subdued the forces of nature and pressed them into the service of mankind, end quote. In this perspective, socialism appears as the relatively simple task of centralized conscious planning of production, a task which is becoming, quote, daily more indispensable, end quote, but also, quote, with every day more possible, end quote. All in all, technological development is manifested in specific modes of production, but far from carrying the mark of the modes of production in its objective structure, technological development actually determines and ultimately transcends the specific modes of production. I'm going to repeat that sentence because I think this is really, really an important summary of... Uh, a certain uh, dogmatic traditional Marxist uh, conception of the relationship between um, modes of production and means of production. All in all, technological development is manifested in specific modes of production, but far from carrying the marks of the latter in its objective structure, it actually determines and ultimately transcends them, such as the essence of technicism as bequeathed to Marxism by Engels. However, even during Engels' life, but more so after his death, the role of, quote, executor of Marx's theoretical legacy fell to Karl Kautsky, who lived from 1854 to 1938. Far more explicitly and consistently than Engels, Kautsky, quote, extended the, quote, materialist view of history, end quote, to the point where the, quote, history of humanity, end quote, became merely a, quote, special case of the history of living beings, end quote, in general, this, quote, special case certainly had its, quote, specific laws, but it could ultimately be grasped only in conjunction with the, quote, general laws of animate nature, end quote. Quite logically, Kautsky explains technological change not in terms of specific social relations of production, but in terms of, quote, human practice, end quote, in general. The, quote, the extension of our knowledge of nature enables us to advance technologically to improve our human activity in terms of the production of life. Every advance in this activity 
brings new facts of nature to light, and thereby the possibility of further advances in our knowledge of nature, which means the possibility and necessity of readjusting our thoughts to the facts, end quote. Kautsky. Quote, nature, quote, economy, and quote, technology are in constant, quote, interaction, to be sure, but the nature of this, quote, interaction is understood on the basis of a, quote, materialist, not a, quote, economic view of history. Yeah, there's, um, 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 yeah. Sorry, I thought I had a profound comment to make. In particular, warns Kautsky, let no Marxist be so, quote, crude as to believe that class contradictions might be objectively contained within technology itself. Henceforth, technology is placed beyond all possible critique, and technicism becomes a self-validating exercise. I was wondering why I was looking at this, and it's... I was wondering why I was like reading this essay, and then I remember the reason that I was reading it is because I was like reading a separate thing. Um, I was reading the revolution betrayed by Trotsky, and he's talking about you know, you know means of production being equated with progress because we improve means of production, increase abundance, and the increasing abundance will, for some reason, more or less automatically result in decreases in inequality. Um, and therefore uh, make capitalism and the state that upholds capitalism unnecessary. And I was thinking about the other essay that's in this piece uh, by Rianio, no, Rianiero Pansieri, um, which I think is how you pronounce his name, which is also a video on this channel, which I'd recommend you check out. Um, this is an introduction to those essays, um, and that's one of the essays that's being introduced here. The Russian Connection, Soviet Marxism. Kautsky and the Social Democrats generally did not, of course, go unchallenged in their claim to be the apostles of Marx. Bolshevism was to a large extent constructed as an explicit repudiation of this claim. To my understanding, um, uh, Bolsheviks, uh, especially Lenin, uh, was a pretty... Uh, convinced Kautskyist and sided with uh, Kautsky in the center against Rosa Luxemburg on the left of the German, um, uh, Demo so German <laughs> the Social Democratic Party of Germany um, prior to a, a World War I. Um, it seems like uh, what the, the Bolsheviks, at least Lenin's understanding, was that um, Kautsky became a renegade, not that Kautsky's, Kautsky switched gears. Um, in terms of uh, his relationship to um, socialism and revolution. Um, not that um, not that he always had some kind of wrong thing that the Bolsheviks were rejecting against. So just based upon that statement, I'm kind of like, hmm, well, I don't know. But let's see where the essay goes, shall we? But whereas the split was quite radical in questions of party organization, parliamentary democracy, state power, and international war, the technicist dimension of social democratic thought not only went unquestioned, but was explicitly affirmed, and if anything, deepened. Okay, now we're getting, that sounds about right, but, um, yeah. That sounds more correct. Let's see if it gets even more correct. The pivotal figure here was the, quote, Russian Kautsky, end quote, Georgi Plekhanov, who lived from 1856 to 1918. As in the case of his German counterpart, Plekhanov's consternation at the misunderstanding of Marxian thought as, quote, economic determinism, end quote, was so great that he hastily conceded an absolute autonomy to, amongst other things, natural science, where, quote, a genius discovers laws, the operation of which does not, of course, depend upon social relations, end quote. The same holds quite logically for means of production, which, though developed in and through specific social relations of production, have logical and historical priority 
over the specific social relations of production. Thus, the reader is subjected to the simplistic generalization that, quote, on the basis of a particular state of the productive forces, there come into existence certain relations of production, end quote. It was from Plekhanov that Lenin, from eight, who lived from 1870 to 1924, learned his Marxism, and although the pupil never hesitated to denounce his teacher's, quote, tactical opportunism, end quote, Lenin was anxious and emphatic that this should not be allowed to blur the fact that in the sphere of philosophy, Plekhanov was, quote, the only Marxist in the international social democratic movement to criticize the incredible platitudes of the revisionist from the standpoint of consistent dialectical materialism, end quote. Lenin. Um, yeah, that quote from Plekhanov, sorry, I'm, I'm reading a footnote after the fact. So that quote from Plekhanov is from his book, uh, The Development of the Monist View of History. I don't have a date for that book. I just have that it was published in Moscow in 1972, which obviously was many years after Plekhanov had croaked. That Lenin thereby affirms social democracy's technicism is clear enough from Lenin's restatement of, quote, consistent dialectical materialism, end quote, in materialism and imperial criticism. But, not surprisingly, though more importantly, this technicism is in the forefront of Lenin's conception of the transition to socialism. From the beginning, the struggle to build the new party was based on a, quote, Marxism, understood as, quote, the ideology of the proletariat trained by capitalism, end quote. To fully exploit this, quote, training by capitalism, the, Mar the Bolshevik must, quote, distinguish between the factory as a means of exploitation, discipline based on a fear of starvation, and the factory as a means of organization, discipline based on collective work united by the conditions of a technically highly developed form of production, end quote. Having drawn this distinction, Lenin proceeds to commend its political significance, quote, the discipline and organization which come so hard to the bourgeois intellectual are very easily acquired by the proletariat just because of this factory, quote, schooling, end quote. It's a fucking dark ass statement. I'm going to repeat that. Having drawn this distinction, Lenin proceeds to commend its political significance. Quote, the discipline and organization which come so hard to the bourgeois intellectual are very easily acquired by the proletariat just because of this factory, quote, schooling, end quote. Meaning that uh, the discipline and organization of the factory is beaten the proletariat into a state of submission to authority that can be easily appropriated uh, by a left party. That's what it sounds like, the implicate, knowing who Lenin is and, the impl and what the statement says. Uh, that's very good. Whereas uh, for Panikuk and for Luxembourg and for others, um, what one of the key tasks, especially for Panikuk, I'm not as an expert on uh, Luxembourg, but I think it's consistent with her views about spontaneity and creativity. Um, that um, what is most important for the proletariat to do is not to become is 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 to break from this submissiveness that is submissiveness that is imposed on them uh, by the bourgeois order, including that ex and especially that in, uh, experienced at the site of production. Um, but I'm not sure. Um, I'm pretty sure, but you know, you shouldn't be sure of what I'm saying. You should take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I personally think uh, what I'm saying is absolutely correct. Um, however, this was not Lenin's last word on the subject. Once the Bolsheviks were installed in power as the state organizers of work, Lenin began to express doubts about the rigor of the proletariat's former, quote, training. Lenin bemoaned the fact that, quote, obedience and unquestioning obedience at that during work, dot, 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 is far, very far from being guaranteed as yet, end quote. Lenin.
However, Lenin took comfort in the fact that the, quote, dialectic of history, end quote, had produced a more effective, quote, training in the form of Taylorism, to which he adopted his usual, quote, dialectical attitude. Quote, the Taylor system, dot, 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 like all capitalist progress, is the combination of the refined brutality of bourgeois exploitation and a number of the greatest scientific achievements in the field of analyzing mechanical motions during work, the elimination of superfluous and awkward motions, the elaboration of correct methods of work, the introduction of the best system of accounting and control, etc. Dot, dot, dot. We must organize in Russia the study and teaching of the Taylor system systematic and systematically try the Taylor system out and adapt the Taylor system to our own ends. End quote. Lenin. Um, there's a footnote here. Uh, footnote. On his own admission, Frederick Winslow Taylor was as, as a management agent who fought to wrest all understanding of and thus all control over production from the workers as a prelude to increase in output. Uh, you really couldn't summarize the Bolshevik uh, thesis at this time. If you've listened to uh, the lecture by, um, there's a lecture on the social histories of revolution, and I don't want to misquote him. Obviously, he's he he's more of saying I mean, there's just tension in Bolshevism, especially in Lenin, about the uh, you know the role of like things like factory committees and workers' control on the one hand, and on the other hand, increasing the productive output of Russia, which is the main, which is uh, based upon this kind of technicism, was the main goal of the Bolsheviks. Um, in the Civil War, which obviously there is, like, terrible, like, material devastation that can't be really uh, argued against. And so, like, you can, there's a certain sympathy you can have with the desire to get fucking the economy going again. On the other hand, uh, um, and so, uh, so you can kind of, like, sympathize with that. And he's more or less saying that, you know, that's in contradiction to this other side of, you know, uh, Lenin is kind of, you know, what's, you know, it's more like democratic or whatever, and more in tune with the libertarian premises of state and revolution. Um, but he basically says what wins out in Bolshevik discourse in practice, not not like later, not like in 1923, not when Trotsky's thrown out of the country, and not in 1921, but even much earlier than that, in the period of war communism, what is most important to the Bolsheviks is increasing the productive capacity of the USSR. And that means applying authoritarian means within production sites and um, disciplinary measures against the direct producers, who would be no other than the proletariat, uh, whose dictatorship um, who are sensibly in total control of the country. Um, so if you're uh, interested in that, I really heck, highly recommend you check out um, uh, check out uh, Stephen A. Smith, who, like I've said in other videos, is one of the uh, top scholars of um, international communism, organized uh, the writing of the... Uh, Oxford Handbook of the History of Communism, which includes a uh, very, uh, very good work in it, um, includes uh, pieces by Paresh Chattopadhyay, uh, the Lenin scholar uh, Lars T. Lee, you, know, you might agree or disagree with them for political reasons, um, as well as uh, people like Donald Filzer in that book. I mean, I really can't recommend checking out that uh, collection enough. Um, and I should read more from it. I haven't finished it, but... Uh, yeah, Stephen A. Smith. Look him up. Good shit. He wrote the Oxford Introduction to the Bolshevik Revolution as well, but like the very short introduction, so check that out. Anyway, back to the text. Um, in the footnote it says, um, See Harry Braverman's Labor and Monopoly Capital. Braverman's own significance for a critique of technicism is discussed below. Um, looking forward to that. This is a way, uh, way more exciting essay than I thought it would be. This is very good. You know, you don't really hear people talk about this collection of essays very much, which is kind of surprising because there's some. It seems like there's some really good shit in here. I think there's another one that's kind of like put out by the. Um, that's a different thing. It's about fucking the production process, which is obviously related. 
but that has, I think, more Italians in it, um, from, like, uh, Italian workerism. Anyway, end footnote. This is no mere, ex more ex mere expedient dictated by the precarious military position of the new Soviet state, but a general, theoretical, and pa practical imperative of the Leninist conception of the transition to socialism. I think that's absolutely correct based upon if you feel, view Trotsky as like a faithful inheritor of Leninism, which I definitely think he is, um, compared to uh, his other counterparts, uh, especially, um, this is this is fundamentally what he thinks is at stake. He, he thinks that um, insufficient material abundance due to a, an impoverishment of the productive forces is the reason for Stalinism. Um is the reason for the bureaucracy, is the reason for hierarchy, is the reason for immense state repression. He thinks it all stems back to the backwardness of Russia, more so than anything else. And that's kind of like, um, you know, obviously he has uh, political critiques of, of Stalinism, of course, but for him, like, he thinks that uh, what, is, uh, what is fundamentally lacking in the Soviet Union is fucking dearth. I mean, or, or what is a, exists in the Soviet Union, at least as based upon the revolution betrayed from 1936. He's saying the reason that this thing is happening is because Soviet Soviet Russia is backwards, and there's uh, because it's backwards, there's uh, class inequality. And because there's class inequality, there's different political uh, tensions within the country. There's you know the bourgeois tension, obviously sensibly represented by the right opposition. There's the bureaucratic, uh, um, you know. There's the bureaucratic uh, uh, interest, which is represented by the center under Stalin, and it tries to mediate between the left and the right, and the left being represented by the left opposition, which ostensibly it represents the working class uh, under Trotsky and his uh, followers and comrades' leadership. Um, he thinks that uh, technicism, technical uh, impoverishment is the cause of all these things. And that the Soviet Union would have not had an, taken an authoritarian turn, a very, well, they already had an authoritarian turn, but an even more authoritarian turn under Stalinism um, without these, uh, if uh, the means of production and the discipline that's required for those uh, means of production to successfully produce the abundance that they are uh, intended to, um, only if those things are uh, present could Stalinism be sufficiently overcome and uh, whose precondition was this uh, material dearth that exists in the Soviet Union, um, more or less. You know, this is the famous thing about, you know, uh, bread lines, you know, fucking uh, create someone who has to manage the bread lines and the person managing the bread lines is the bureaucracy and the bureaucracy because of this position of managing the bread lines and managing this dearth um, because of the backwardness of the productive forces uh, you know becomes uh, a cancer a parasitic cancer on the bulk of society so I think this uh, author I mean uh, you obviously like I said you have to listen to my fucking uh, marginalia, but uh, I think this author is very correct that it's a, a, pra a theoretical and practical imperative of the Leninist conception of the transition to socialism. I think that's absolutely correct. Anyway, crude materialism, reflection theory, and the quote dialect of history fuse logically into a technicist model which turns from a social democratic dream into the state workhouse of the USSR. Lenin himself did not live in cons to consolidate his dream, which was the work of Stalin who lived from 1879 to 1953. Um, it's important that, um, it's important to note that, um, you know, uh, you know, there's just kind of like a whole idea within Trotskyism that like the, you know, in its, you know, anti-peasant turn in the late 20s and early 30s, the so-called Stalinist center stole the program, or to some extent, of the... Uh, uh, left opposition, which, you know, people debate about whether Ch Trotsky, you know, would employ his violence of a means. A lot of people can think that he would not have, as would, as, um, um, Stalin, um, that, that brutality being really unprecedented, um, in scale and is fucking horrific for the, uh, rural population. Um, but there definitely praises this kind of, uh, you know, 
there's definitely this praise of like the or like you know the the, the Stalin basically did a uh, uh, fast industrialization wrong. It's basically um, a very important paper is the book by is the paper on Trotsky that I can't remember its fucking name, but it's like something like. Um, I don't know, but his name, the guy's name, I believe, is uh, John Eric Merritt. The, uh, the piece is on um, uh, Trotsky uh, and the debates within the Soviet Union. And it kind of argues that the person, the only person who really quite, who, I think it argues, I can't remember exactly, but I think it argues that the only person who is actually kind of like tethered to the concrete reality of, the, uh, of where the Soviet Union was at was Nikolai Bukharin. Um, and that what would have been the necessary thing to uh, industrialize um, the Soviet Union on a more democratic and egalitarian basis uh, would have been the extension of the NEP with a reintroduction of democracy um, into the, the reintroduction of uh, Soviet democracy with more room for maneuver for things like trade unions and more like... Uh, direct working class organizations being able to actually advocate for uh, their interests substantially before the state. Um, that would have been uh, the, the, the least uh, brutal and most uh, egalitarian and democratic road to industrializing the Soviet Union. That's what he basically says. But he basically says that, like... Uh, yeah, like, uh, and I think that seems like, I mean, at least from what I'm reading in the fucking book, is that this kind of, like, the the material aspects, the technological aspects of the first five-year plan, which can't really be, uh, the, the, the economic dimensions of the five-year plan are her heralded and celebrated as if in any substantial way that type of accumulation, that breakneck accumulation could not be achieved uh, could be achieved without extreme exploitation of the direct producers. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. I mean, maybe I'm wrong. If you're a Trotsky expert, you can, can, can critique my, uh, summary, some of, uh, kind of, like, summary of his kind of, like, uh, shallow critique of Stalinism. That does not tie the the five year plan, um, and industrialization, um, directly to the social conditions and everyday life of the direct producers. Anyway, Lenin himself did not live to consolidate his dream, which was the work of Stalin, who lived from eighteen seventy nine to nineteen fifty three. Along the way, Stalin also produced a codification of dialectical and historical materialism. That's an italicized. It's a book. That is disarmingly simple. First, one needs to understand dialectical materialism in the manner of Engels. Then, one applies dialectical materialism to the study of society in the form of historical materialism, which, true to the universal nature of dialectics, reveals that, quote, the productive forces are not only the most mobile and revolutionary element in production, but are also the determining element in the development of production, end quote. Applied to contemporary capitalism, this worldview demonstrates that, quote, capitalist relations of production have ceased to correspond to the state of productive forces of society and have come into irreconcilable contradiction with them, end quote. Revolutionaries thus learn that their, quote, mission is, quote, to replace the existing capitalist ownership of the means of production by socialist ownership, end quote. Once again, quote, dialectics performs the feat of purging technology of any objective class structure and restricting the transformation of production to a simple question of property rights. Stalin, is as, well, as is well known, did not have an easy job in his attempt to formulate and embody the, quote, true spirit of Marxism-Leninism. On the contrary, Stalin was assailed 
and pilloried by Trotsky, who lived from 1879 to 1940, on a vast series of problems ranging from, quote, socialism in one country to the struggle against fascism. But precisely because of this mutual animosity, the technicist continuum in social democratic and Bolshevik theory and practice is revealed all the more strikingly when one realizes that even in his attack on Stalin's breakneck terroristic industrialization program, Trotsky never once entertained the thought that this program might in fact be in perfect harmony with the objective structure of machine technology, electrical power, and Taylorism. As if sensing that he was on the threshold of heresy, Trotsky affirmed his own orthodoxy by stating that, quote, Marxism sets out from the development of technique as the fundamental spring of progress and constructs the communist program from the dynamic of the productive forces, end quote. And as if to prove that these were not empty words, Trotsky elsewhere extended Lenin's, quote, dialectical appraisal of Taylorism to Henry Ford's work in constructing the first conveyor belt production line. Revolutionaries, according to Trotsky, should not aim not to smash Fordism, but to, quote, separate Fordism from Ford and to specialize and purge Fordism. This, we are told, is what, quote, socialism, end quote, does. This is revolution. That's from Rev uh, these quotes are from Revolution Portrayed, um, page 45, which ironically might have been the very pages that I read today. Actually, no. This is from Trot That last quote is from Trotsky's Problems of Everyday Life, so they're not all from Revolution Portrayed. Excuse me. Yeah, but this idea that, you know, th this idea of separating Fordism and Taylorism uh, uh, from um, their capitalist shell uh, very, very uh, bizarre uh, conception to me. We are thus dealing with a time-honored tradition that takes in the otherwise ununitable Engels, Kalski, Plekhanov, Lenin, and as a mere footnote, Stalin and Trotsky. The list could be expanded ad infinitum and ad nauseum, but to underscore the fundamental reformism of this tradition, one should perhaps close with Harold Wilson's vision of, quote, forging socialism in the white heat of the scientific technological revolution, end quote and his Euro-Communist counterpart, Santiago Curillo, whose own brand of reformism quite legitimately establishes its, quote, orthodox credentials by emphasizing that, quote, what can really be inferred from the development of the forces of production is that modern society is ripe for socialism, end quote. Santiago Curillo. I do not know who Santiago Curillo is, so I am going to look him up. I'll just read the first paragraph of the Wikipedia to you. Santiago José Carrillo Salares was a Spanish politician who served as General Secretary of the Communist Party of Spain from 1960 to 1982 during the Civil War. Santiago Carrillo was placed at the head of the Republican militia and was in charge in maintaining public order in Madrid. Some hold him responsible for the massacre of Franco's prisoners that took place at the end of 1936. Santiago Carrillo was exiled during the dictatorship of Francisco Franco, becoming a leader of the democratic opposition to the regime. Santiago Carrillo's role as leader of the PCE would later make him a key figure in the transition to democracy. Santiago Carrillo later embraced Eurocommunism and democratic socialism and was a member of the Congress of Deputies from 1977 to 1986. Yeah, so that's a, it's interesting. Um, yeah. 
and uh, yeah, no one needs to. Uh, no one needs to uh, be reminded. I don't think maybe they do of the intensely uh, counter-revolutionary uh, actions of the Soviet Union and the Communist Party of Spain during the Spanish Civil War, which is wonderfully documented in many places, but I highly recommend people read or listen to the audiobook, as I did, of George Orwell's Homage to Catalonia, which uh, is a first-hand account um, of these, uh, these developments, which I think is indispensable reading. Um, if I, I, I read it late, but if I was a... Uh, person who was getting introduced to socialist ideas for the first time, uh, if I was to recommend a book to anyone, I'd recommend uh, Homage to Catalonia. It's uh, phenomenal, in my opinion. All right, I'm going to take a break. So if you hear more shuffling, it's because uh, <laughs> I stopped record. I, I restarted recording again. So thanks for listening to my uh reading thus far, and the uh, marginalia and notes. I hope I didn't say anything ac inaccurate, and like I did, you should, uh, like uh, always, you should always um, take what I say with a grain of salt, and uh, think of, maybe think about it, but uh, don't take it for granted, because I'm just a guy, <laughs> and I don't really fucking uh, know as much often as I pretend to know. Yeah. Um, assume I'm an idiot. All right, thanks. A pseudo-critique of technicism, Mao, Althusser, and Bettelheim. As we shall see presently, this powerful technicist tradition has not gone totally unchallenged in the history of Marxism. However, before proceeding to assemble the rare but invaluable elements for a genuine critique, is imperative to deal with a recent theoretical current which, while claiming to constitute such a critique, in fact merely scratches the surface and, worse still, ultimately accommodates itself within the technicist tradition. A critical assessment of this current will, though largely negative, serve the positive purpose of forestalling any premature restriction in the terms of reference of a gut genuine critique of technicism. The pseudo-critique in question finds its most up-to-date expression in the work of the French Maoist Come Althusserian and Charles Bettelheim. The main object of his attack is a, quote, simplification of Marxism, which is traceable to the European labor movement of the 1880s, but which took its most terrible toll within the Third Communist International, particularly in the late 1920s. The, quote, simplification in question involves presenting the development of the productive forces as the, quote, driving force of history, end quote. This thesis of the, quote, primacy of the productive forces, quote, prevents one from using rigorously the concepts of historical materialism and leads to incorrect political formulations, end quote. Historical materialism, by contrast, teaches first that, quote, the driving force of history is the class struggle, end quote, and second, more specifically, that socialist social relations can arise only through class struggle. Unfortunately, the significance of Bettelheim's non-simplified Marxism turns out to be less dramatic than one might have expected. In fact, Bettelheim goes on to rehabilitate the very thesis he claimed to repudiate, quote, in general, that is, as long as the prevailing production relations do not hinder their development, it is the productive forces that play the principal and decisive role, end quote. The only, quote, qualification, end quote, to this barefaced technicism is that the class struggle takes over as the, quote, principal and decisive, end quote, factor whenever the productive forces, quote, can no longer develop within the limitations of the prevailing production relations, end quote. Bettelheim, Class Struggles in the USSR, First Period, 1917 to 1923. In fact, this is no qualification of technicism at all, since this intervention of revolutionary class struggle in the, quote, principal and decisive role, end quote, is determined by the, quote, development of the productive forces themselves. 
anyone expecting to learn how Bettelheim's quote, non-simplified, end quote, Marxism enables one to use the concepts of historical materialism, quote, rigorously, so as to construct, quote, correct political formulations is in for an unequal, is for, is in for an equal disappointment. As we, excuse me, all we gather is that Marxists should ascribe to the, quote, major role, excuse me, all that we gather is that Marxists should ascribe the, quote, major role in the construction of socialism, not to the accumulation of new means of production and technical knowledge, but to the, quote, initiative of the working people, end quote. Beyond this well-meaning generality, Bettelheim says little than nothing. The idea that there is no teleological development of the productive forces to begin with let alone with that let alone that specific class relations might be objectively contained within specific means of production is not even contemplated. This theoretical block is quite consistent with Bettelheim's acknowledged debt to the French philosopher Louis Althusser. In the latter's work one finds the same dual pronged attack, namely on the quote f exaltation of the development of the productive forces, end quote and, quote, the elimination of the relations of production and of the class struggle, end quote. But, in Althusser's case, that's from Essays in Self-Criticism, but in Althusser's case, the in innocuous nature of this, quote, critique of technicism is quite explicit and theoretically grounded, albeit in terminology bordering on hieroglyphics. Marx's, quote, total theoretical revolution, end quote, is presented as a theory of the, quote, different specific levels of human practice, economic practice, political practice, ideological practice, scientific practice, in their characteristic articulations based on the specific articulations of the unity of human society, end quote. Out to Sayre, that's from four marks. Despite endless talk of being, quote, determined in the last instance, end quote, by what Out to Sayre calls the, quote, economy, these, quote, levels enjoy a, quote, autonomy, which the epithet, quote, relative, can do nothing to challenge. Indeed, any real attempt to show how the economy of capitalist society determines the technological ensemble would immediately call forth cries of, quote, economism from Althusser. Footnote. Wisely, however, he chooses silence in the case of Cornelius Castoriadis, who anticipated Althusser's and Bettelheim's stress on class struggle by more than a decade, but who took this so seriously that he embarked on a critique of technology itself. Castoriadis' work is discussed below. I don't know if I said this, I'm sorry, I'm reading this in fragments, but like, yeah, Castoriadis was uh, one of the... Uh, one of the first people to critique, uh, sincerely critique productivism in Marxism. Especially because for Castoriadis, one of the things that's uh, really important uh, is that for him, uh, he doesn't view social, he, you know, he says some quote, I can't remember exactly what he says, but it's something to the effect that, you know, socialism isn't an industrial prison next to a nice house in other words like uh creating uh satis merely uh satisfying consumer needs uh on the part of the population is not what uh socialism is about and so there is like a problem with conceptions of socialism that view um emancipation as Surely the application of the most advanced technology in order, order to advance consumption and leisure time. Uh, there has to, for Castoriadis, there has to be a fundamental um, direct democratic alteration of the relations of production um, at work. Work needs to change for Castoriadis, not just um, uh, who and how it's appropriated. 
like his uh, critique of the relations of production are, uh, I think, generally deeper than a lot of his peers. Back to the text. But if Bettelheim acknowledges a debt to Althusser, both men repeatedly acknowledge an overriding debt to Mao Zedong. 1893 to 1976, whose work must therefore be briefly considered. The first thing which must be stated is that Mao is the author of several famous articles propounding a technicist perspective, pure and simple. For example, On Contradiction begins with the, quote, basic law of materialist dialectic, end quote, namely the, quote, law of contradiction in things, end quote and goes on to explain that when Marx, quote, applied this law to the study of capitalist society, quote, he discovered that the basic contradiction of this society is the contradiction between the social character of production and the private character of ownership, end quote. Um, that's from Mao's Four Essays on Philosophy, published in Peking in 1968. Dialectics even affirms that, quote, in the contradiction between the productive forces and the relations of production, the productive forces are the principal aspect, end quote. Admittedly, Mao contradicts himself perhaps to prove the universality of the, quote, basic law of materialist dialectics, end quote, by stating elsewhere in the same article that, quote, in capitalist society, the two forces in contradiction, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, form the principal contradiction, end quote. But throughout this equivocation, one thing remains quite clear. Mao regards the productive forces as transcendent of specific social relations of production, and what is more, Mao is obliged to do so by his metaphysics. However, to forestall the accusation of basing one's own account of Mao on an article written before the communist seizure of power, the Great Leap Forward, or the Cultural Revolution, let us turn to a later but equally haloed work, or hallowed work, H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D, namely, Where Do Correct Ideas Come From? This article paraphrases a famous and provocative statement by Marx to the effect that, quote, it is man's social being that determines his thinking, end quote. But in Mao's hands, this is, quote, substantiated by a puerile restatement of the crude materialism and reflection theory that rendered Marx's thesis meaningless. In the same manner, having tantalized the reader with the thesis that, quote, correct ideas come from social practice and from social practice alone, Mao becomes more precise, quote, they come from three kinds of social practice, the struggle for production, the class struggle, and scientific experiment, end quote. The division is along clear Kautsky lines. Kautsky's warning on the dangers of, quote, crudity seems not to have fallen on deaf ears. However, rather than pursue an epistemological argument, it will be more rewarding to conclude with the collection of articles entitled A Critique of Soviet Economics, which is the basis for even more ambitious claims on behalf of Mao's status as an anti-technicist theoretician of the First Order. Footnote, see, for example, Derek Sayer's review article in Capital and Class number 8. This appraisal is elaborated in length in P. Corrigan for Mao. Here it is true, Mao does criticize his idol Stalin for wanting, quote, nothing but technology, nothing but cadre, no politics, no masses, end quote. But on the question of technology, Mao still works with evolutionist categories like, quote, backward and, quote, advanced, rather than dealing with specific social relations of production and his insertion of, quote, politics and, quote, the masses, boils down to the hazy notion that mechanization and automation must not be made, quote, too much of, end quote. 
Instead, Mao counsels, quote, a sense of proportion, end quote, the moralizing substitute for a critique of technology. Critical Sparks Luxembourg, Korsh, and Gramsci Turning now to those thinkers and doers who have managed in varying degrees and forms to extricate themselves from technicism, one can usefully start with Rosa Luxemburg, who lived from 1871 to 1919. Luxemburg's unique contribution to Marxism lies in the fact that while repudiating both the overtly reformist as well as the sham orthodox currents of the Workers' Party, she simultaneously took issue with the technicist basis of Lenin's related broadside. Luxembourg's rejection of the notion common to both Kautsky and Lenin of socialist consciousness being, quote, introduced into the proletarian class struggle from without, end quote, took the form of a spontaneous prospect in which, quote, the proletarian army is recruited and becomes aware of its objectives in the course of the struggle itself, end quote. Indeed, these very objectives appear as the product of that struggle such that there can be no pristine, quote, class consciousness from without, end quote. All that can be distilled are the general principles of the struggle itself. There's a footnote here that says, see Lenin, uh, Collective Works, Volume 5, where Cal page 383 f where Kautsky's formulation is quoted at length and described as quote profoundly true and important end quote these general principles can say little or nothing of a positive nature about socialist reconstruction but they can and do deal mercifully with the residual capitalist values within the socialist movement for example, Lux Luxembourg pillories Lenin's hymn to factory discipline as evidence of his mechanistic conception of socialist organization. For her part, she explicitly rejects the idea of a technocentric continuum in the transition to socialism, at that time still referred to as, quote, social democracy, end quote. Quote, the self-discipline of the social democracy is not merely the replacement of the authority of the bourgeois rulers with the authority of a socialist central committee. The working class will acquire a sense of the new discipline, the freely assumed self-discipline of social democracy, not as a result of the discipline imposed on it by the capitalist state, but by extirpation, to the last root, its old habits of obedience and servility. End quote. Luxembourg. In the wake of the Bolsheviks' actual seizure of power 13 years later, Luxembourg's revolutionary imperative became, if anything, even more impassionate. Quote, One's attitude to Rosa still strikes me as the best test of revolutionaries, end quote, was the opinion of Karl Korsch, who, who lived from 1886 to 1961. Yeah, I didn't realize he was born that early. I should have, though, because I've definitely read a lot about Karl Korsch, so I should know, like, his birthday. Quote, one's attitude to Rosa still strikes me as the best test of revolutionaries, end quote was the opinion of Karl Korsch, who lived from 1886 to 1961, whose break in the 1920s with the technicism common to both social democracy and Bolshevism grew out of a rejection of the crude materialism and reflection theory that form the technicism common to both social democracy and Bolshevism's me metaphysical base. Whereas ever since Engels, historical materialism had been reduced to a, quote, application, one among many of an overall metaphysical system, Korsh took the opposite direction, quote, the correct materialist conception of history, dot, 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 is incompatible with separate branches of knowledge that are isolated and autonomous, end quote. 
More specifically, Marx's critique of political economy, quote, never ceases to be a critique of the whole of bourgeois society, and so of all of bourgeois society's forms of consciousness, end quote. The failure of, quote, social democracy to grasp this scarcely needed, stating what the Bolsheviks' parallel course needed to be exposed in full with direct reference to its reformist consequences. Quote, the, quote, new materialism, end quote, of Lenin is the great instrument which is now used by the communist parties in the attempt to separate an important section of the bourgeoisie from the traditional religion and idealistic philosophies upheld by the upper and hitherto ruling strata of the bourgeois class, and to win them over to that system of state capitalistic planning of industry which for the workers means just another form of slavery and exploitation, end quote. Karl Korsch, Marxism and Philosophy. The failure of, quote, social democracy to grasp this scarcely needed stating, but the Bolsheviks, oh, sorry. I'm getting mixed up here. That last quote was a, is a footnote here. It's from Karl Korsch, Lenin's Philosophy, printed as an appendix and wrongly attributed to Paul Maddock in Anton Panikuk's Lenin as Philosopher. Panikuk's anti-technicism is summed up and even deepened by Korsh, and thus does not merit separate discussion here. In this way, Luxem so back end footnote. In this way, Luxembourg's rejection of Lenin's factory discipline is theoretically grounded in a repudiation of its technicist base. base. The court and Korsh thereby implicitly indicts a time-honored tradition stretching back to Engels. <laughs> If Korsh's immunity to a pre-critical and quite logically technicist metaphysics of matter was in some sense due to Korsh's appreciation of classical German idealism, something similar happened in Italy in the case of Antonio Gramsci, who lived from 1891 to 1937. While much of the prison notebooks is concerned to criticize the indigenous idealist tradition, particularly for its abstraction from class struggle, Gramsci felt that this tradition was perhaps closer to the critical spirit of historical materialism, dubbed the, quote, philosophy of praxis, end quote, than was the technicist materialism popularized, for example, by Nikolai Bukharin in the early 1920s. Gramsci asked, quote, Might not the idealistic conception, according to which nature is none other than the economic category, be reduced once cleared of its speculative superstructures into the terms of the philosophy of praxis and demonstrated to be historically linked to, and a development of that philosophy. In reality, the philosophy of praxis does not study a machine in order to know about and to establish the atomic structure of the machine's materials or the physical, chemical, and mechanical properties of the machine's natural components but only in so far as it is a moment of the material forces of production, is an object of property of particular social forces, and expresses a social relation which in turn corresponds to a particular historical period." End quote. This not only brings technicism into question, but even implies a critique of the objective structure of technology. Historical Materialism, Commodity Fetishism, and the Critique of Technicism, Lukács. In anticipation of any misguided euphoria, however, it must be stated that Gramsci, Korsh, and Luxembourg were complex, even contradictory thinkers whose break with orthodoxy was far from definitive. Numerous passages in their work reveal a residual technicism in one form or another. 
But more importantly, even in their anti-technicist moments, Luxembourg, Korsh, and Gramsci's theoretical frame of reference offers little in the way of constructing a critique of technology in the spirit of Marx's critique of political economy. This is particularly true of Gramsci, whose enthusiastic, quote, revolution against Karl Marx's capital, end quote, was not merely a repudiation of social democracy's evolutionist determinism, but also testifies to a lifelong disregard of Marx's analysis of capitalist production as value and process. By way of total contrast, Georg Lukacs, who lived in 1885 to 1971, undertook a theoretical revolution on the basis of Marx's capital. Lukács, too, is a complex figure who went through many phases and who actually produced one of the most cynical defenses of Soviet Marxist technicism ever to appear. Um, that's titled uh, Die Zerstörung der Vernunft. But in the early 1920s, when serious theoretical work on revolutionary communism did not yet mean expulsion from the Communist Party, Lukács proved himself a very gifted revolutionary thinker. Indicatively, Lukács' main achievements included an attack on technicism, as well as some serious progress in the direction of a critique of technology. As a first introduction to this dimension of his work, one should consult Lukács' attack on the technicism personified by Bukharin, an attack, incidentally, that is far superior to Gramsci's. Lukács' general point is that, quote, this attempt to find the underlying determinants of society and its development in a principle other than that of the social relations between men in the process of production leads to fetishism. I'm going to repeat that again, just for my own sake. Lukács' general point is that, quote, this attempt to find the underlying determinants of society and society's development a principle other than that of the social relations between men in the process of production, dot, 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 leads to fetishism, end quote. In particular, quote, it is altogether incorrect and un-Marxist to separate technique from the other ideological forms and to propose for it a self-sufficiency from the economic structure of society, end quote. Yeah, um, I think what's being said there, uh, in so many words, is Taylorism is not merely a tool. Not that tools are ever merely tools, but it's not merely just you know, a neutral, objective thing. It has um, uh, it has uh, socially uh, implicated content, I guess. Given Bukharin, giving Bukharin a lesson in history which could long since have been learned from capital, Lukács points out that the social preconditions of modern machinofacture predates the latter's technical re realization, which can only be theorized as, quote, the consummation of modern capitalism, not capitalism's initial cause, end quote. Um, this is absolutely, uh, this is absolutely crucial right here, um, this, uh, little quote, because, uh, if you read, uh, political Marx, like, like I've mentioned before, if you read, like, political Marxism, say, like, Ellen Nixon's Wood, or, um, Robert Brenner, um, there, and other people as well, but their entire thesis is that the capitalist mode of production, um, by making, uh, producers market-dependent, um, fundamentally dictates how production is carried out um, locally. So, for instance, um, the uh, social pressure, the advantage, like I said before, maybe in another piece on from Revolution Betrayed, um, uh, so the, the economizing of time, which is sort of like um, you could say is like one of the primary goals of 
uh, capitalist production and sort of generally there's like a you know has the kind of like the shadow effect of orienting our relate the modernity's relation to time in general um is dictated uh by factors external to uh immediate production in other words what i'm trying to say is that there's this idea that um humanity has this uh transhistorical uh desire to uh economize on uh time uh, to reduce the amount of time everything takes um, to the barest minimum uh, and that we're kind of constantly always striving for that and that's what drives uh, the technological uh, revolution um, uh, many Marxists now especially the most sophisticated even like from theoreticians down to historians um, kind of understand that like uh, um, the capitalist imperatives on uh, farmers, for instance, in say, uh, you know, early modern England, uh, press them uh, to seek out technological developments in order to undermine, uh, in order to uh, uh, reduce cost, in order to maximize profits, and either uh, expand uh, their scope or to, uh, by reducing the prices of their commodities or uh, enjoying uh, surplus profits that would be uh, invested uh, later down the road. Um, the, uh, so what's basically what Lukács just said here is like, um, you know, that the social preconditions of modernization, modern machine factor predate the modern machine factor's technical realization, which can only be theorized as, quote, the consummation of modern capitalism, not modern capitalism's initial cause, end quote, um, speaks to this, that uh, capitalism creates the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution does not create capitalism. Obviously, it's not so, uh, you know, obviously the... Uh, the use value dimension of the industrial revolution does have uh, uh, effects on the value relation and the expansion of capitalism for sure it's not that the the, uh, uh, the physical stump substratum of uh, human uh, of, uh, capitalism is irrelevant to capitalism of course not um, uh, technology obviously has a uh, Tremendous implications um, and has causal relevance to uh, um, social developments within capitalism, but it doesn't, it's not fundamentally uh, the prime mover. And especially is not the initiator of, so, of, of capitalism. Capitalism is the initiator of the explosion of, of technological growth, uh, not vice versa. Anyway, the implications of this perspective are drawn out in Lukács' classic work, History and Class Consciousness. His fundamental principle is that Marx's theory of commodity fetishism can be made to, quote, yield a model of all the objective forms of bourgeois society together with all the subjective forms corresponding to them, end quote. Lukács applies this not merely to the subjective form of technicism, but to the factory system itself. Quote, time sheds time's qualitative variable flowing nature. Time freezes into an exactly delimited quantifiable continuum filled with quantifiable, quote, things, dot, dot, dot. In this environment where time is transformed into abstract, exactly measurable physical space, an environment at once the cause and effect of the scientifically and mechanically fragmented and specialized production of the object of labor, the subjects of labor must likewise be mathematically dissected. Dot, dot, dot. Mechanization makes of them isolated abstract atoms whose work. Dot, 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 becomes mediated to an increasing extent exclusively by the abstract laws of the mechanism which imprisons them, end quote.
the factory, sorry, end quote, that's from History of Class Consciousness. The factory could not possibly achieve this, Lukács added, quote, were it not for the fact that the factory contains in concentrated form the whole structure of capitalist society, end quote. This strikingly and provocatively reveals the profound difference in, between parroting isolated Marxian aphorisms on the, quote, dialectic of history and actually basing oneself on the analysis contained in capital. Footnote. Regrettably, the Belgian Trotskyist Ernest Mandel uses the occasion of his introduction to the otherwise impeccable edition of Volume 1 of Capital in the Pelican Marx Library to reduce the, quote, contradictory nature of the machine to a simplistic, quote, contradiction between use value and exchange value, end quote. The fig leaf for this technicism is provided as so often by empty talk of, quote, Marx the dialectician, end quote. Um, yeah, I think you should, uh, I think, uh, for, uh, in one of the introductory chapters of, um, uh, of, of the way that, um, just like the concept of dialectics is just kind of thrown around without very much precision. In Michal Heinrich's uh, introduction to the three volumes of Karl Marx's Capital, he talks about the way that the, the term dialectics um, is kind of like uh, sloppily thrown around in order to uh, compensate for lack of certain like precision. Um, it does, it's, he says something to the effect of like, uh, you know, and know it all he uses the word know it all. It says like when a know it all, when you're discussing the you know the introductory chapters of Capital, you can always say like, oh, we just have to do everything dialectically. And it's like, well, what they mean more or less mean by that in most cases is that um, um, everything affects everything else, and everything's interconnected, and all this kinds of things, which is uh, uh she says like is like is true more or less true, but it doesn't explain anything. Um, and that's kind of like the problem with just kind of like, uh, you know, uh, just kind of like, that's the problem with metaphysics in general is that they become, um, just kind of, uh, I mean, maybe this isn't, this isn't what he's saying, but this is what I'm saying. It's like the problem with metaphysics, which is basically what metaphysics is. If you're kind of like, you know, you hear the term a lot and you don't understand it. Basically to my understanding, if the study of metaphysics is the study of um, the nature of reality um, uh, without um, recourse to the senses, basically, based upon a priori considerate, just a priori considerations, a priori without experience considerations of uh, truths. Uh, what can we? What can be said about the nature of reality? which is what distinguishes it from physics, which is a science. And metaphysics is a rigorous study, of course, or can be a rigorous study. Um, and we all make um, you know, metaphysical uh, presuppositions, uh, make, have pre, uh, metaphysical presuppositions in all the things you think. Like, for instance, like, does God exist or not? It's not like an empirical question you can solve with a microscope or a telescope. You can't just like look off into space and if you never see God, you know, you can't really say whether God exists or not because just by the sheer definition of what God is, he exists outside, or if he does exist, exists outside of space and time and that's all that we have access to and then blah, 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 blah. But these are kind of, that's what, that's what uh, the, like metaphysics is. It's just kind of like, um, um, arguments about the nature of reality without appeals to science. Now, in uh, you know, because you know, uh, Marxism is you know, so-called like scientific. You know, although what about it is scientific is often usually vaguely just alluded to. What is vaguely, uh, you know, is uh, and if it's like uh, you know, it's not really uh, thoroughly fleshed out. I mean, if you want to say it by science, it's like a rigorous uh, social science based upon an analysis of what exists and that anything that could come after has to take uh, into account what is currently existing and not just, you know, uh, fundamentally rewrite the world from scratch upon, about, with a, you know, upon a bunch of, you know, 
empirically unverifiable assertions about shit. Um, but because, like, Marxism is ostensibly scientific, like I said, whatever that means, uh, dialectical materialism usually, and this is true of just metaphysics in general, often, uh, in order to explain its arguments, makes appeals to, uh, you know, natural, uh, the natural sciences, or make, explains things how natural science instantiate, um, proof of a metaphysical argument. So, for example, like, you know, I think one of, you know, one of my, um, you know, metaphysical assertions would be, like, the existence of, like, strong emergence, um, strong emergence being something, being, meaning that, um, uh, when complicated systems come together, when complicated components, uh, come together, um, the, uh, the, uh, the whole that they create fundamentally changes the parts, and fundamentally changes important features of the parts, even if the parts still remain a necessary moment of that whole. So, for instance, like, um, both hydrogen and oxygen are flammable, but H2O is not. Uh, fundamentally, their combination fundamentally changes what they are. And so uh, you could say the same thing about uh, like, like table salt, for instance. Table salt, uh, the components of table salt, which are like not eluding me right now, it's like sodium oxide or something. I don't fucking know. But the, the core ingredients of table salt that we eat all the fucking time, both of the, the uh, elements of that are uh, present. Um, that are, that are present in table salt are poisonous to human beings on their own, but not in the form of table salt. Um, so there's this idea that like the combination and, and the same thing with like when people like you know capitalism for instance um, fundamentally changes uh, the smaller units. You know that's what subsumption fundamentally means is that uh, capitalism, however you want to conceptualize, it's coming or into existence or like talk about the hist history of that once it does come into existence and it has its own legs and is a system it fundamentally changes the behavior of individuals within it um from like what firms do down to what individuals do um you know, you know a firm might uh you know lay off a bunch of people because the economy forces it to despite what it wants to do may or may not want to do um the uh in capitalism, you know, may force an individual to uh, sell a kidney or something like that, which is uh, Werner Bonefeld's always talking about. This. <laughs> always makes references like how much for a kidney or something like that. Um, but uh, he, uh, but uh, yeah, so um, you know, that's an instance of metaphysics. It's a kind of like an assertion about the nature of the cosmos, and you can use. Uh, uh, people use that's just an example of the way people can use like features of science to explain uh, metaphysical presuppositions and that's why things like that's why you know um historically uh, there was such a problem with science in the soviet union amongst other things is because um you know it was based on this kind of met the entire ideology of stalinism uh and Soviet Marxism was based on a very dogmatic assertions about the nature of the universe, not just the nature of society, but the nature of reality. And if science, um, which needs uh, to actually empirically uh, engage with the world and create things and kind of not, not try to uh, do violence against empirical findings by trying to cram them into preconceived concepts, um, that causes a problem for dominant ideologies. It causes pro like science empirical research causes problems for dogmas um and so uh yeah that's just kind of the, um that's that's the uh that's basically what i'm meaning by uh you know the uh the, the problem with metaphysics and so like when someone's you know when someone's trying to explain something and they just say oh dialectics or whatever it's just kind of like I'm not going to explain this relationship. I'm just going to say that there's a relationship there and not really kind of like elucidate what, how empirically that relationship has played out or works out or whatever. The, it's kind of just like a generalized assertion about the way things are. You know, metaphysics can, especially dogmatic, uh, you know, 
metaphysics uh, can have that feature, you know, like Christianity or like theological <coughs> or like uh, Islam or uh, any kind of like theological uh, notion of the world is a metaphysics. Like Christianity says things about the way the world is uh, prior to any kind of like rigorous empirical, that is sense-based perception. I mean, self-pit, sense-based uh, um, investigation of the world in any kind of rigorous way. It makes assertions about it. And that's why, you know, when people, like, preserving church dogma, which I think you could say that uh, Soviet Marxism was a kind of church dogma, um, usually has a pretty hostile relationship to science. And, uh, you know... Uh, you know, in terms of that, and that's kind of explains like stakhanovism, you know, uh, amongst other things. I don't want to reduce stakhanovism to just dogmatism, even though dogmatism clearly plays a strong role in that. When you kind of just like, um, when something's an empirical question and you try to make it dogmatic, that is like, and like also that's the other feature of metaphysics as well, is that like, uh, its truths more or less are necessary truths. They're not like probabilities. It's like, oh, this is the probability of happening, or like, this must be the case. Um, you know, this based upon reason alone, like, this must fundamentally be the case. The like, necessary a priori truths about the world that aren't subject to probability. They either are or are not the case. They are, they're, uh, they either, they're like, they're lulls, they're not tendencies. They're not, um, like, so, um, be very careful. And this is the kind of, like, the danger of, I think, for me personally, I think it's, like, the danger of philosophy. Is that philosophy, um, and just theory, and the theory is like this too, even though they're both, like, you know, it's not, like, necessarily the case. But often, um, when you're just throwing around concepts, and you're just throwing around, you know, uh, uh, abstractions and those abstractions are meaningful you have to use abstractions to kind of conceptualize the world but when you're just doing that without any reference to uh, empirical reality um, you know that's uh, that's no good that's one something I've actually been sorry I'm talking a lot now but it's one of the things I've actually been like realizing uh, with my like research into uh, the Soviet um, critical conceptions of the Soviet Union from Marxist and radical left perspectives, uh, is that, uh, you know, when people say things about, like, well, you know, the USSR was state capitalist or whatever, especially when you're thinking about, like, the early, like, left communist critiques of the USSR, they say, it's, you know, state capitalism um, thesis, and it's, there, it's uh, I don't think it's wrong, but what's important to remember is that there was a change from the new economic policy to Stalin's revolution from above. And you have to, any kind of like a conception of what the Soviet Union was would have to take account, take into very serious account the developments that took place not only in the immediate, you know, aftermath of the revolution in the 1920s, but also what happened between, you know, say 1928 and 35. So like just kind of like, there's a degree to which just like blunt ad tools are just blunt, exactly what they are. They're blunt tools, like they're boxes which curtail thinking and lead one to make erroneous and dogmatic uh, claims about the world. Uh, that's not uh, what I was saying before. Is not saying that state capitalist thesis was wrong or anything. It's just like one has to take into account developments, history, changes. What can we what can we observe? What data is had? And that's like, uh, and like, I think that like, uh, the violence, um, you know, at least partially, like the, the violence of the Soviet Union was based upon certain dogmatic assertions about, uh, the nature of, uh, uh, the cosmos. And even in like the social sciences, if you have like a dogmatic, uh, a predisposition that lends you to think that there's something automatically emancipatory about the factory and what is good for humanity is the creation of more factories and the creation of abundance um, that can allow that can 
if that's the fundamental good, it can cause you to treat actual human beings like raw material and meat, um, which is anything but um, emancipatory. Uh, so be careful about, I guess what I'm saying is like, um, that these aren't just errors. I think, they, I think some of these errors have very serious political consequences. Um, in terms of like the the terms of like just like what does traditional Marxism in a quasi religious fundamentalist dogmatic way assert about reality without testing it or questioning it or defending it rigorously um, or taking challenges to it seriously um, uh, yeah but anyway. Sorry, that was way too long. I, I should talk, but for my own sake, but uh, that was probably way more than you needed to hear about. But, yeah. Anyway. Revisionist ambivalence, Marcuse, Gorsh, and Braverman. I wanna, I'm not sure how you say that guy's name. Is it Gortz? Andre Gortz? He's Austrian. That sounds French. I'm gonna see what German to English. How, how does the. Uh, Internet, tell me to say. Andre Gortz. Andre Gortz. Andre Gortz. I mean, it sounds like it's Gortz. Um, yeah. Revisionist ambivalence, Marcuse, Gortz, and Braverman. That's uh, Herbert Marcuse, Andre Gortz, and Harry Braverman, I believe his name is. With Lukács' Kalto to Soviet Marxism in the mid-1920s, the critique of technicism became increasingly divorced, at least temporarily, from the organized labor movement. This is illustrated by Korsh's increasing isolation after his break with Moscow, but it is even more marked in the case of Herbert Marcuse, who, though never actively involved in working-class politics, was nonetheless destined to keep alive something of Lukács' critical spirit. Common to the whole, quote, Frankfurt School was a Lukácsian repudiation of crude materialism, reflection theory, and technocracy. But it was Marcuse who, again, following Lukács' lead, extended this as early as 1941 to an attack on Taylorism as a, quote, streamlined autocracy, end quote, in which the laws of physical science and technological reason fused inextricably with the capitalist profit motive. Footnote. The, quote, Frankfurt School position on this score is presented at its most elaborate in Alfred Schmitt's The Concept of Nature in Marx. And footnote. In the early 1960s, um, I don't know if he's going to mention that, but uh, Herbert Marcuse wrote an extensive book on Soviet Marxism that I very much need to read. So, anyway... In the early 1960s, Marcuse developed this into his famous thesis of one-dimensionality within which the attack on technological rationality was absolutely central. Quote, not only the application of technology, but technology itself is domination of nature and men, methodical, scientific, calculated, calculating control. Specific purposes and interests of domination are not foisted upon technology, quote, subsequently. And from the outside, they enter the very construction of the technical apparatus, end quote. Herbert Marcuse, Negations. 
As part of what he called the great refusal, Marcuse stretched from for signs of working class struggle against this technological monolith, and in the wake of 1968, he enthusiastically, enthusiastically spoke of a, quote, collapse of work discipline, slowdown, spread of disobedience to rules and regulations, wildcat strikes, boycotts, sabotage, end quote. And just to make quite explicit his rejection of social democratic and Bolshevik technicism, both as a metaphysical system and as a political strategy, Marcuse's last work identified elements of a revolutionary consciousness in, quote, the struggle against the entire capitalist and state socialist organization of work, the assembly line, Taylor system, hierarchy, end quote. Uh, two footnotes here. The, some of those quotes were from an essay on liberation, and the other were from The Aesthetic Dimension by Herbert Marcuse. But despite this welcome break from the theory and practice of technicism, Marcuse's revisionism cannot be passed over in silence. While not going as far as to repudiate Marx's analysis of value and process, Marcuse equally shies away from adopting Marx's analysis of value and process as his frame of reference. Instead, as in the case of his, quote, Frankfurt School, end quote, colleagues, the full weight of the incipient critique is supposed to be borne by the elusive category of, quote, domination. As a result, Marcuse's critical contribution is restricted to a number of stimulating but diffusely scattered semi-aphoristic insights, which in the absence of a theoretical framework to sustain them are precarious in the extreme. Um, yeah. Footnote it says, uh, this is the flaw, uh, passing over Marcuse's, uh, critique of technology and sciences, uh, this is the flaw in Phil Slater's Herbert Marcuse and the analysis of the labor process, Mimeo 1977, which does, however, serve the useful purpose of assembling Marcuse's most radical observations on technology for which the present author is indebted. Um, yeah, this is like generally, I think if you like, I think this might, this is generally like a very common critique of like the more radical generation of Frankfurt School influenced thinkers is that, um, you know, uh, is that, uh, and this is also debated, I mean, uh, the, I have essays on here from the collection Marx and Adorno, which is all about Adorno's critique of political economy and Dirk Brownstein, uh, or Brownstein, um, who's like a, I think he might be, have some kind of, be some kind of central figure in the current day Frankfurt School, or is at least a student or a teacher in Frankfurt that's like affiliated he has some kind of organizational thing, but he wrote a book called Adorno's Critique of Political Economy. So there's all kinds of people who would say that like this is not exactly true about the Frankfurt School, that they do actually uh, have things to say about uh, Marx's critique of uh, uh, political economy, at least on the um, like that what you would uh, value critique people like Robert Kurtz might call like uh, the esoteric. Uh, aspect of Marx's uh, critique of uh, political economy, such as like you know, fundamental things like value, commodity, money, and so on. Um, but generally, I think people kind of have the idea that um, I think a lot of people kind of have the idea. Of, like I think like uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I think Patrick Murray, in like his entry from the Sage Handbook of the Frankfurt School Critical Theory. Frankfurt School Critical Theory kind of like criticizes this kind of like, I don't know, this kind of like what he thinks is like kind of like an abstract cultural um, critique of what he, of instrumental rationality that does not fundamentally tie instrumental rationality into the, uh, to the, uh, to capitals imperatives, um, the social imperatives of capitalist value and process, as was said here, um, to use that word, to use their wording, um, to some degree, that's like why it's like it's like the heavy flaw of like 
uh, critical theory because it's like uh, insufficiently steeping itself in the critique of political economy. Although, like I said, there's like debate about it, and you know, obviously, uh, Frank or School were uh, thinkers with a lot of uh, diverse interests. So you know, whereas a lot of people, a lot of Marxists are kind of like focused a little bit more about in particular things. Also, um, the thing that I was also going to say is that uh, in the defense of the Frankfurt School, um, if you think about, you know, war, or you think about, like, the role of planning in the contemporary, uh, contemporary capitalist economies, or if you think of, like, the Soviet Union, um, whatever, without, like, you know, I don't know what the official position of any of those uh, figures were on, on it. Um, maybe, uh, what's his name? Friedrich Pollock would have categorized uh, the Soviet Union as state capitalist. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, but they're kind of fundamental. They're doing, there's this kind of idea at this time that's like really present. And I think like Leninism has a lot to do with this the idea that the market and competition are kind of like not really fundamentally important issues so kind of like analyzing uh, critiquing or like analyzing uh, markets or um, value wasn't particularly important um, in this period and you know because everything is ostensibly monopoly capitalism now so like you know Value, the value, uh, the law of value is so highly distorted that it's not really that, uh, a cons that much of a constitutive factor of social life because the concentration and centralization of capital have expanded to such a broad and totalizing degree that uh, uh, competition between firms is replaced by monopoly um, or something like that. Um, so they're not really alone in this kind of shying away from value and process. And I think that especially with the rise of Stalinism and like the war economies of the, uh, that developed in, you know, the build up to World War II um, with heavy state intervention in the economy kind of made questions of like instrumental rationality, new questions like was, I don't know, for instance, like. Um, obvious, like, we, I, like, in the Soviet Union, for instance, you know, when they're trying to, like, make broad generalizations about industrial society as such, maybe not necessarily just about capitalist society, um, there clearly is, like, um, the, you know, if you, uh, read Revolution Betrayed, uh, I was reading it today, I'm kind of reading it back and forth with this, and he was talking about how Trotsky was saying that the fundamental, uh, ambitions of the Soviet uh, system, the Soviet regime, you know, it's, uh, Trotsky's writing it in 1936, four years before he's assassinated, or it's published in 1936. No, it's, you know, it's written in public 1936, I think, as well. Um, he says, uh, its two main goals are like military defense and uh, industrialization, increasing of labor productivity via industrialization. That's its goal. Um, as And so I can't, like, could you really say that, like, profit and surplus value acquisition, obviously accumulation and exploitation are going on, but does the specific mechanism through which that exploitation and accumulation taking place, is it necessarily taking the form of value augmentation and appropriation? Um, you know, that's a question. I mean, uh, well, depending on it, and it's just, and again, it depends on how you conceptualize the Soviet Union. Like, was it state capitalist? Was it bureaucratic collectivist? What were the, what was the role of markets there? Like, I don't really have firm answers for those questions myself, but it's kind of like if, you know, markets and value and, uh, 
if surplus is not taking the form of value in those countries, but is taking some kind of like um, bureaucratically controlled in-kind type of surplus. Uh, and you could probably say the same things about, you know, military expansion, obviously, at some extent too, um, is that kind of expansion and kind of that like instrumentation of human life to serve purposes antagonistic to those human lives. Um, is that necessarily reducible in some sense to the imperatives of value uh, augmentation? I don't know. Anyway, the same applies to the more substantial contributions of André Gortz. On the one hand, he argues that, or, quote, organization, production, technology, division of labor form the matrix that invariably reproduces through inertia hierarchical work relations, the capitalist relations of production, end quote. As regards the latter, Gortz emphasizes quite correctly that, quote, the goal of capitalist production can only be the growth of capital itself, end quote. But Andre Gortz traces this to an undifferentiated extortion of surplus labor. Oblivious to the fact that for Marx, Gortz is a vowed teacher, capitalism is specifically characterized by the fact that surplus labor is extracted in the value form. And that's very, that's very, very important. It's very important whether you're categorizing a society as capitalist or not, because obviously not all exploitative societies must necessarily be capitalist in character. Uh, surplus labor can very, can at least theoretically and, and historically has been extracted um, without the mediation of uh, commodity, money, and uh, value. Um, what's specific to capitalism is that the surplus is extracted in the value form, and I think that's a very good point for uh, this author, uh, Monica Reinfelder, to uh, make. <laughs> Thus, instead of viewing the immediate process of production in Marxian terms as the unity of labor process and valorization process, Gortz, like Marcuse, abandons value theory in favor of a unity of, quote, technique of production and, quote, technique of dominating those who are producing, end quote. This revision, sorry, that's from, that quote is from Andre Gortz's uh, book, uh, The Division of Labor. This revision explains a number of things. First, the ease with which Gortz slips back into a technicist perspective of science and technology being, quote, incorporated, end quote, from the outside, explicitly granting them a, quote, degree of irreducible autonomy, end quote. Second, Gortz's uncritical celebration of the Chinese Cultural Revolution and its panacea of collective, quote, initiative. And third, his explicit identification with Charles Bettelheim. Um, yes, I would uh, highly recommend uh, the one. Um, I can't, is it Idriesta's Revolt? I don't know. Whoever the person is who does that was a big inspiration for this channel, and uh, I really thank them for everything that they've uh, done in terms of uh, making uh, very interesting uh, radical literature available on YouTube. But one of the things that uh, Reeves she, it's a female voice, I don't know, that doesn't really necessarily mean anything, but. Um, uh, they say that they have a video on um, their channel by the uh, Lauren, uh, by the editor of Insurgent Notes, uh, Lauren Goldner, um, about um, uh, notes towards a critique of uh, Maoism, um, and also elsewhere. I think the Insurgent Notes has a YouTube channel where they only put up one video, but the one video they put up was tremendous by Lauren Goldner explaining the role of the working class in China to global capitalism today, and he talks about the Cultural Revolution. He's like, he really doesn't like the term, because it's not about culture, and it's not about a revolution. It was a, uh, a, a faction fight uh, that summoned the masses in order to uh, bring, like, Mao's click uh, uh, back into the saddle uh, after they had been kind of, like, uh, kicked out of substantial power uh, after the failures 
the colossal human failure of the uh, uh, Great Leap Forward, which killed somewhere between 20 and 50 million people, um, giving uh, Mao's China the great honor of having killed the most members of its population during peacetime. Anyway, yeah, but for like a critique of the Cultural Revolution, I highly recommend that. Obviously, within the Cultural Revolution, like the, as noted by what's it called, Wither China, uh, the Wither China group. Obviously, there was you know discontent within society, as there is within all Stalinist societies. There is socialist, there is social uh, discontent, and. Uh, Obviously, some of the forces within the Cultural Revolution took a more something on a position that was probably maybe perhaps more comparable to uh, some of, like maybe like uh, I don't know, Kronstadt or like the Hungarian uprising, which tried to like uh, create a kind of uh, <sighs> democratic, independent, uh, working class version of socialism in China, but that was uh, put down of course uh, I've also heard that the majority of deaths in the Cultural Revolution were not caused by Red Guards that were participating in it obviously they did good share of violence a lot of the deaths were done by the People's Liberation Army putting down the Cultural Revolution um, anyway yeah so that I mean that is a flaw of someone's like celebrating the Cultural Revolution I think that's a very um, historically problematic uh, view. Um, the same ambivalence is found in Harry Braverman's widely read labor and monopoly capital. On the one hand, Braverman stresses that only with the development of machinery is capitalism's goal of the domination of dead labor over living labor established as a physical fact. On the other hand, theories which view machine technology as, quote, negative in its objective structure, are in Braverman's estimation, quote, constructed on every level to exonerate capitalism, end quote. Um, Braverman, uh, labor and monopoly capitalism. In this situation, there is no alternative, certainly no, quote, Marxist alternative, but to return to a simple use slash abuse model, garnished with some anthropological generalities, quote, it is not the productive strength of machinery that weakens the human race, but the manner in which that machinery is employed in capitalist social relations, end quote. If the ambivalence evident in Gortz is here resolved in favor of the technicist dimension, the revisionism behind it is all the more explicit, abandoning Marx's surplus value in favor of a generalized, quote, surplus. Braverman glibly outlines the, quote, major, thesis that, quote, monopoly capitalism tends to generate a greater economic surplus than monopoly capitalism can absorb, end quote. Footnote. Laying his revisionist cards on the table, Braverman adds, quote, I recommend to the reader the excellent exposition in Baron and Sweezy's Monopoly Capital, end quote. Um, yeah, uh, it seems like a little less of a thing now uh maybe not maybe it's not less of a thing just like it seems like the, the main emphasis i hear about it is like um uh Baron and sweezy were really polarizing figures in uh people who took theoretical questions seriously on the radical left um so this kind of uh yeah so that saying that his revisionist, you know, when it says laying his revisionist cards on the table, Braverman uh, ad, uh, recommends Baron and Sweezy's monopoly capital. Um, it's uh, indicating uh, Monica Reinfelter's uh, um, political uh, or theoretical and political orientation. Um, yeah. End footnote. Thereby, Braverman blithely ditches value theory, the basis upon which Marx structured capital, and as we have seen, Lukács' point of departure for a repudiation of technicism and a critique of technology.
the revolutionary, quote, anti-Marx, Castoriadis. While Marcuse, Gortz, and Braverman all reveal an, excuse me, reveal an ambivalence ultimately rooted in their revisionism, they do not nonetheless acknowledge that their anti-technicist movements are somehow indebted to Marx. This stands in total contrast to the Greek cum French ex Trotskyist Cornelius Castoriadis, who argues that one can only develop an anti technicist revolutionary theory and practice on condition that one breaks with Marx altogether. To this end, Castoriadis does not, as with Bettelheim or Althusser, simply attack the idea of productive forces being history's quote, dynamic element. End quote. Rather, Castoriadis challenges the whole notion of, quote, productive forces, end quote, to begin with, be writing in 1962, but drawing together ideas he had been developing since the 1950s, Castoriadis writes, quote, it is one thing to recognize the fundamental importance of Marx's insights on the connections that exist between production and other aspects of life of a society, dot, dot, dot. But it is another thing to reduce production, work, and human activities mediated by instruments and objects to the level of, quote, productive forces, i.e., in the end, to the level of technology. And it would be just as wrong to grant to technology an evolution which, quote, in the last instance, end quote, would be autonomous. Uh, that was Castoriot, end quote. Castoriotis writing is Paul Cardan. Uh, history and Revolution. Um, uh, 196, I believe that uh, Société de Samo ended in 1965. Maybe in 1967. I gotta look this up. I suppose I'm supposed to know this. Nineteen sixty seven, so my second guess was correct. So this that piece is from when he's still writing in, in Socialisme au Barbary. In reality, Castoriadis argues, quote, technological evolution, far from being an autonomous, homogenous teleological continuum, is determined, quote, by the development of the proletariat and by the struggle waged in the womb of capitalism, end quote. In total contrast to Bettelheim's account, the class struggle does not simply, quote, intervene, end quote, in the transition from one mode of production to another, but actually determines the development within the mode of production. Thus, if there is any sense at all in speaking of a, quote, contradiction between productive forces and relations of production, it is not in the sense of a transcendence of capitalism. Quote, in the last 25 years, the productive forces have undergone a development far in excess of anything previously imaginable. Dot, dot, dot. But it has not altered or challenged the capitalist nature of the relations of production. What seemed to Marx and the Marxists to be a, quote, contradiction, which would lead to the explosion of the system, has been, quote, solved from within the system itself. End quote. Castoriadis. Yeah, um... Anyway, as a result, the revolutionary assault on capitalism, far from, quote, taking over an existing technological ensemble, must take the form of an assault on that technological ensemble, along with its very canons of scientific and technological, quote, rationality, canons to which Marx himself, by and large, remained enslaved. Footnote. This is elaborated at its fullest and most provocative in Cornelius Castoriadis, um, I think it's a, it says Le Curfew du Labyrinth. I think it's a, I think it's at the crossroads of the labyrinth. Um, or the labyrinth at the crossroads or something like that. While Castoriadis thus repudiates what the technicists uphold, he nonetheless stands on common ground with them as regards the content and location of Marx's, quote, message. 
While mocking the vulgarizers for ignoring the cornerstone of Marxist theory, namely capital, Castoriadis himself shows a marked tendency to rely on the, quote, 1859 preface so popular with the vulgarizers. Footnote. Karl Marx preface to a contribution to the critique of political economy. We can safely dispense with quotations since they all they abandon the technicist tradition traced above. We shall simply observe that the frequency of quotation from this preface is usually in inverse proportion to the seriousness according to the contribution as a whole. End footnote. When Castoriadis does turn to capital is to copy out passages reaffirming the, quote, dialectic of history, rather than to study Marx's analysis of, quote, machinery and large-scale industry. This failure, too, Castoriadis shares with the, quote, orthodoxy he so despises. And last but not least, Castoriadis seems oblivious to the fact that his proposed critique of technology was pioneered long ago by Lukács on the very basis of capital, in particular its analysis of the value form. Yeah, I read the first two uh, books of uh, Castoriadis' uh, political writings, which are from like the late 40s to like the, I think the third volume goes into the late 70s, but the first two volumes are from like the 40s and 50s and early 60s. Um, yeah, and I don't think he ever, I don't recall ever hearing him mention Lukács. This negative state of affairs can non nonetheless serve as a convenient conclusion to our introduction which has itself pursued a predominantly negative, even iconoclastic goal. We started with the tentative prospect of a critique of technology and saw how this presupposed breaking the spell, presupposed breaking the spell of a dominant technicism that encompassed even ostensible critical thinkers like Bettelheim. We then saw how a number of activists, most notably Lukács, did start to break the chains of technicism, but we also recognized that their achievements were either left in a rudimentary state or else, as with Lukács, consciously cut short by subservience to Moscow. Next, we assembled a number of critical insights from thinkers who have achieved prominence in the tumultuous period since the mid-1960s, but here we were forced to note an unmistakable ambivalence and prever prevarication I don't know what that means Gotta look that up uh, prevarication means the deliberate act of deviating from the truth synonyms fabrication lying types of prevarication, or fibbing, paltering, a trivial act of lying, or being deliberately unclear. So let me reread that sentence now that I know what the word means. Next, we assembled a number of critical insights from thinkers who have achieved prominence in the tumultuous period since the mid-1960s, but here we were forced to note an unmistakable ambivalence and prevarication attributable in no small measure to an either latent or blatant revisionism. And finally, we were faced with the figure of Castoriadis, whose critique of technicism was as merciless as his verdict on Marx. However, given the simplistic account of Marx offered by Castoriadis and by the, quote, orthodoxy Castoriadis pillories so effectively, we can conclude our introduction with the clear awareness that though we may have broken the spell of technicism, the task of elaborating the significance of Marx's critique of political economy for a critique of technology is still before us. It is to this task that the following articles address themselves. Thanks for listening, everybody. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a very exciting book to continue reading. Um, thank you.